Greetings and welcome back to Intersections. One of the things that has really struck me is how we in humanity are inherently a super curious species. You know, if you think about it, right, uh, from time immemorial, we've always wanted to know what lies, what lies beyond. You know, we've lived in a certain part of the world, we wanted to know what lies beyond, and that led to a whole range of explorers on the Earth's surface. You know, we, we wanted to know what lies beyond the horizon. And, and once we understood our own planet, we wanted to know what lies beyond our planet. And then we sent out these, you know, these astronauts into, into outer space. And then we wanted to know what lies beyond our solar system. And these advanced, you know, telescopes, et cetera, have allowed us to kind of understand, you know, the universe at a much bigger and broader level. And that same curiosity could also be brought to bear on the edge of life, what lies, in a sense, beyond, beyond life. And so um, I couldn't feel more blessed than to have in our midst today someone, uh, Dr. Bruce Grayson, who has dedicated his career, his intellect, his strivings towards seeking to understand that, that edge, that intersection between life and what lies beyond. Let me offer up a couple of um, elements of, uh, you know, Dr. Grayson's background and then have you, um, you know, invite and welcome him into our midst. As I'm doing that, I want to invite you also to use chat to just say hello, get, you know, get to connect with each other, share where you are calling in from today. Uh, let's get connected. So Dr. Grayson is one of the world's leading medical experts on near-death experiences. Uh, he has a bachelor's in psychology from Cornell, um, an MD from the Sunny Upstate College of Medicine, and has had a range of positions across a range of universities in the medical and psychiatry profession as an assistant professor at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, then at the University of Michigan School of Medicine, then a professor of psychiatry at the University of Connecticut, and a professor emeritus of psychiatry and neurobehavioral sciences at the University of Virginia. School of Medicine for the last 25 years. Um, he has been a pioneer in this movement of science-based research on something that we call near-death experiences. And we will ask him to come and introduce that, you know, that subject to us. Um, has been a founding force in the um, Institute for the Advancement of Near-Death Studies and you know, of the Journal of Near-Death Studies. Um, he has had international recognition for his work, including addressing symposia on consciousness at the United Nations and also at the American Psychiatric Association. He has been recognized as a Distinguished Life Fellow, the highest honor that is bestowed by this organization. He's been a distinguished speaker and thought leader on these near-death experiences and um, has, has written about it in a book that came out some time ago which he collaborated with a num number of other leading researchers on, the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, but then also one that has just come out recently, which we are going to highlight and talk about because I, I think this is just an incredible contribution to the advancement of our understanding of something really profound, and uh, we will talk about that. He's been featured on a number of leading media as well for his work, and um, on that note, let me uh, invite uh, Dr. Grayson into our midst. Well, thank you, Atendra. I'm delighted to be joining you today. Uh, you know, it's it's a real, real, real pleasure. Um, you know, the, the show is called Intersections because we are seeking to really dissolve some of those those boundaries that sometimes limit us and confine us to just yeah. um, you know some ways of thinking and not others. And and you uh, and your work just uh, so beautifully represents um, that point of intersection. You know, we've talked about life and beyond, but also of like science and spirituality. I mean, your book yes. um, has such profound statements and ideas in it about your own, you know, quest towards um, bringing these two worlds together. And I know that's going to be a topic I'm going to really enjoy in a short while as we get into, into that part of the discussion. So, so thank you for joining us today, Dr. Thank Gray. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I ask you to, uh, since the theme of today's conversation is near-death experiences, if you could, you know, just maybe define that for us, what, you know, what is sure. a near-death experience? A near-death experience is a profound primarily spiritual event that many people have when they come close to death or in fact are pronounced dead that may include things like a sense of leaving the physical body, a sense of overwhelming peace and well-being, uh, often finding themselves in some apparently otherworldly realm that's not the physical world, 
that they may then encounter other beings, uh, usually a warm, loving being of light that they interpret as a deity. Sometimes they see other entities they interpret as deceased loved ones. They often have a review of their entire lives. And at some point, they may come to a point where they make a decision to return to life or are told to return against their will. And for me as a psychiatrist, one of the most interesting parts of the experience is not the experience itself, but how it transforms people's lives afterwards. And I've been able to follow some of these people now for many decades, and the changes in their attitudes, beliefs, values, and behavior are quite marked and long-lasting. You know, Dr. Grayson, what strikes me is that here you are, someone very steeped in the you know, rigorous world of science and, and medicine, uh, with all the right qualifications and the right positions that you've held throughout your career, you're not, um, you know, you're not a renegade, you know, in, in, in the world of science, you know, I, I, for the path that you have taken on and for the recognitions that you have received. And so for someone who is, um, you know, so scientific, you know, in your, in your temperament, um, was there, was there any kind of challenge in taking on a discipline that uh, one doesn't really, you know, by happenstance stumble into in, in college like science courses? Yeah, of, of course, of course. And it continues to be a challenge for me because it, it raises questions about our very beliefs about the mind and the brain and about how we fit into the universe. Uh, you know, I started out life as a scientist, as a materialist. Uh, my father was a chemist, and we, in my family, as we grew up, we never talked about anything that was non-physical. Uh, you know, the idea of anything spiritual, anything religious was just never never talked about in our family. Um you know, we assume that, that what you see is what you get. The physical world is all there is. And that when you die, that's that's the end. And that was fine with us. You know, there's no reason to complain about that. That's just the way it was. So I went through a college and medical school with that materialistic mindset that we are physical beings like other animals. And then after I finished medical school, in my first months of my psychiatric training, I was asked to evaluate a patient in the emergency room who had overdosed. And I went to see her and she was unconscious. I tried to arouse her, spoke to her, moved her limbs around. She has no response at all. But her roommate who had brought her in was waiting to talk to me in another room 50 yards down the hall. So I talked to the roommate and got information about the patient, what was going on in her life and what she might've taken in the overdose. And we talked about 15 minutes and then I went back to the patient and she was still unconscious. So she was admitted to the intensive care unit overnight and I managed to see her the following morning after she awoke. Well, when I went to see her, she was barely awake. She could barely open her eyes. I introduced myself and she said to me, I know who you are. I remember you from last night. Well, that kind of startled me because I, I thought she was totally unaware of me last night. So I, I said to her just that. I said, I, I thought you were asleep. I didn't realize you knew you could see me. And then she opened her eyes and said to me, not in my room. I saw you talking to my roommate, Susan, down the hall. Well, that just made no sense to me at all. Uh, the only way she could have done that is if she had left her body and come down the hall with me in it. And I couldn't understand that. As far as I could tell, I was my body. How can you leave it? Uh, so she sensed my confusion and went on to tell me about the conversation I had with her roommate, where we were sitting, what we were wearing, the questions I asked her, her answers. And it, it just blew me back. I couldn't understand this. Um, but you know, I couldn't deal with my confusion and my job was to help her with her confusion. <laughs> so I had to kind of stuff my feelings aside and, and try to work with her in my psychiatric role. And as the days passed and I tried to reflect on what happened here, I, I just couldn't accept it. It didn't make any sense to me. It didn't fit my worldview. I tried to tell myself, I misheard what she said. I misinterpreted it. They were playing a trick on me. I don't know how, but I just kind of stuffed it away. And it wasn't until several years later, in 1975, when Raymond Moody published a book called Life After Life, in which he gave us the name for these phenomena, near-death experiences, and described what they were like. And fortunately, he was working at the University of Virginia with me at the time. So I was able to read his book and talk with him. And I realized that this, what this one patient had told me was not just one event from one psychiatric patient but part of a huge phenomenon that millions of people all over the world were talking about. I still couldn't understand it, but I couldn't deny that it was happening. And as a scientist, I thought it's my responsibility to look into this. 
you know, you can't be a skeptic if you don't become skeptical of your own viewpoints as well. So because it challenged everything I thought, I had to devote my life to, or at least some of it, to trying to understand it. And here, 50 years later, I'm still trying to understand it. In, in, in doing that work to try to understand it, uh, Dr. Gerson, you have made certain seminal contributions to this discipline, mm. isn't it? Um, and um, you know, I wanted to ask if you could perhaps, for those of us who are in some ways, let's say, you know, skeptics, who mm. are still perhaps um, like you have been you know, raised uh, with this view yes. of life is purely physical, who may um, hold that view. Right. I want to just kind of like invite if you're listening to this conversation between Dr. Grayson and me for you to, you know, for a moment, just uh, open ourselves up. Right. <laughs> you know, in, in the spirit of curiosity and then one can go back right to uh, whatever belief it is that one, you know, holds there. But you just open oneself up for exploration. Right. And as part of that exploration, Dr. Grayson, in the journey you made. How, you know, how have we been able to bring a sense of scientific rigor to what otherwise sounds um, quite uh, otherworldly? Well, I, I, first, I appreciate you asking people to be skeptical because I think that's the way to, to learn things. And I feel like I'm still a skeptic. I'm still challenging my own beliefs every day. But when we first started looking into this, we collected stories that individual people told us. And of course, I realize that one story does not prove anything. Um, but when you collect a lot of stories, and I'm talking about hundreds or thousands of stories, then you can start looking at patterns that consistently emerge in these accounts. And you can statistically analyze what they say and find out what are the, the current uh, currents that, that go across cultures, across religions, and what are the consistent commonalities in these experiences. And then you can develop hypotheses about them that you can test. Um, for example, most of these things happen when people are either pronounced dead or very, very close to death. So being a bit materialist, I thought about what are the things that go on in the body or in the brain that may be related to this. And the first thing that comes to mind is that you've got a lack of oxygen going to the brain. Because no matter how you come close to death, that's the final pathway that usually happens. But we were able to look at the data and it turns out that when you're close to death, if you have a near death experience, you actually have more oxygen to the brain than if you don't report a near death experience. And it was the same way with, with drugs that were given to patients. Many patients are given drugs, of course, as they're nearing death, but it turns out that the more drugs you're given, the less likely you are to report a near death experience. So drugs and lack of oxygen do not seem to be causing the experience. If anything, they're inhibiting the experience. And we've tested theory after theory about this, about brain surges of electricity, um, maybe chemicals produced in the brain. And every time we've been able to collect data, they've been contradicting these theories. Now, of course, some of them we can't test. Uh, one of the prominent theories is that there's some sort of hallucinogenic drug produced in the brain at the point of death, like DMT. And that's a nice theory, it's, it's plausible, but there's really no way to test it because you're talking about a chemical that's released in tiny amounts for a short period of time, and we don't even know where in the brain to look for it. And how are you gonna do that when someone's in a near-death crisis and you're trying to resusc resuscitate them? Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm drawn to you know, having you like help us um, at a, you know, at kind of like a popular science level, at a, mm -hmm. at a kind of like a, a level that we can consume and understand, what you see as the most significant and notable findings from this research, and uh, having you know gone through gone through uh, after, um, yeah. uh, w which is a tremendously compelling read, um, I was struck in particular by um, you know by this notion of the life review. You know, we can mm -hmm. talk about other effects as well. Yes. But yes. I don't know, if, if, would it make sense to start there and talk about sort of that sure. as one of the seminal findings of this research? Sure, sure. Many, many people have a life review of some sort in the near-death experience. And by that, I mean, they come to a point where they relive um, sometimes their entire lives, sometimes just highlights from their life. And it's not just like watching a movie. It's actually feeling like you're reliving the experience. And they often feel like as they go through this, uh, event, they judge themselves of what things they did right, what things they might have not done, not have done quite right. 
they usually don't report feeling judged by some other entity, but it's a self judgment. Um, and from that, they learn about mistakes they've made and, and things they want to change if they come back. And of course, the ones we talked to always did. What's striking is that in a good number of these life reviews, uh, the experiencer relives the event not only through their own eyes, but through the eyes of someone else as well. And let me give you an example of this. Uh, Tom Sawyer, that was his real name, uh, had a near-death experience in his 30s when a truck he was working under fell down and crushed his chest. And as part of his near-death experience, he had a very elaborate life review in which he relived many, many things in his life. But one thing that stands out to me is that as an event when he was 17 years old, a hot-tempered um, uh, teenager, he was driving his truck downtown and a drunk man happened to walk out in front of his truck and Tom almost hit him. He was furious. So he rolled down, stopped his truck, rolled down the window and started yelling at the man. And the man, unfortunately being drunk, reached his hand in the window of the, of the truck and slapped Tom across the face. Well, that was too much for Tom. Uh, so he opened the, the car door, the truck the door, got out and started pounding the guy mercilessly with his fists until he left him a bloody mass in the median strip. And then he calmly got back in his truck and drove away. Well, in his life review, he really lived that not only through his own eyes, but from the eyes of the drunk man. And he saw his face, Tom's face, getting redder and redder, and then felt Tom's fists coming into his face. 32 blows, he said. And he felt his nose getting bloodier and bloodier, and he felt his, his uh, teeth going through his lower lip, and he felt the humiliation of being beaten by this young kid. And... Tom came away from this experience realizing that we're all in this together and that we are not ultimately separate individuals, but we're all interconnected. And he said, it's like, if you look at your hand, if you look at just the, the fingers, uh, it looks like they're all separate. But if you look at the whole thing, you see that they're all interconnected and that what you do to somebody else, you're ultimately doing to yourself. And I've heard this from experiencer after experiencer, that they come back from the life review realizing that we're all the same and that the way to really get through life is by basically following the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's a precept of almost every religion we have. And there's a reason for that. And I think that's because most religions were influenced by experiences like near-death experiences, mystical experiences in which this basic truth is told to them. But the experiencers say to me that for them, the golden rule is no longer just a guideline we're supposed to follow. They realize it's a law of the universe, like gravity. You know, you can't avoid it. This is the way things are, period. So if you want to get along in the world, you need to live according to that. There are just so many incredibly profound, profound things you just shared with us there. there. Oh, by the way, I'm, by the way, I'm getting, getting an getting echo. An echo. Um, let me see if we can uh, do something about it. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, let's talk about the life review first, and then let's come back to the golden rule. Um, so the idea that at that moment, when we are departing from the stage of life, our whole life flashes in front of us. Hmm. Are you seeing things that we have consciously remembered and repeatedly revisited in our minds, you know, those experiences and moments? Or are you... Are you saying even even things that we may not be consciously, you know, holding on in our memories? Right. There are often things that you haven't thought about in decades, some things you had totally forgotten about that come back to you. And they also report that when they relive these events, they are aware of so many more things that they didn't become aware of when they were actually going through it. For example, I've been told that you know, when I remember this scene, I can count the mosquitoes that were hovering around me. I couldn't do that when I was living it. But going through the life review, it slowed down and I had time to, to perceive all the things I didn't perceive as I was living through it. It's as if time seems to expand or stop existing in, in the life review and they can take all the time in the world to, to relive this experience. Mm, wow. Um, it almost seems to me that, you know, when in the spiritual world we talk about something like judgment day, I mean, I mean maybe it's yeah. not like... Uh, Something where one day at some point, you know, we will magically come out, you know, from our graves and be, uh, be, you know, be 
you know, kind of like try it in some court of uh, divine law. Yeah. Maybe that is like a moment of almost like judgment day happening where it is we ourselves who are the jury. Yeah, it is. And it's, sometimes they are, the, are, they are very surprised by the things that they remember. For example, George Ritchie, who was a psychiatrist actually, uh, had a, a near-death experience with a heart attack. And he had um, a life review in which he thought he would be, he thought that if he had life, he would remember the highlights in his life, like becoming an Eagle Scout and the Boy Scouts and graduating from medical school. And he said, those things weren't important at all. And the things that were highlighted in his, in his life review were simple day-to-day -day events where he was helping somebody do this or that, trivial things that we thought at the time. But in his life review, these were the important things, the way he treated other people. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, from from I, I, instinctually, from from a young age, I've been kind of like drawn to this visualization of what would what would I be feeling at that moment that I'm you know passing on from this life? What would I be feeling in that moment as I look back at the arc of my life, however long or short it was? And what you've done with the life review is given me a tangible feeling of what we may actually experience in that moment. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Personally, I found it to be um, something that really grounds me, you know, more closer to my core, uh, knowing and imagining that moment that may lie ahead. Yeah. Have you have you have you seen anything like that where uh, with these uh, folks that you're calling experiencers, right? Those who have um, uh, experienced a near death experience, right? Yeah. Um, that when they emerge from this, that it kind of like has a defining impact on the rest of the life. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, Barbara Harris had an experience when she was, she had a respiratory arrest when she was in, in the hospital. Uh, and she had a life review which she remembered vividly having been abused as a child by her mother. And this was not something she repressed. She remembered it. But in the life review, she did it in much greater detail. And she also remembered it through her mother's eyes. And she saw that her mother was suffering as much as she was. And sort of reliving the abuse she, her mother, had had as a child and was caught in this pattern. She didn't know how else to relate to, to mothers and children. And what Barbara got from this was that this was a pattern she and her mother and probably her mother's mother had been trapped in and were just repeating through the generations. And coming out of that, she made a determination not to continue that with her own children. And that really changed how she related as a mother. Um, so many people learn from the near-death experience what things they were doing that were called mistakes. Interestingly, they never they never talk about the concept of sins. Uh, they always say, "I was doing this wrong, and now I know how to do it right." Oh wow, that's uh, that's really special uh, to hear. Uh, it's interesting because we are living at a period, in, for example, in management history and business history, mm. uh, where. Um, there is a, kind of like almost a similar discipline uh -huh. uh, and an ethos that uh, you know organizational experts are striving to bring into business consciousness, which is uh, not to make failure you know something that uh, permanently you know is a scar on a team or on an individual uh, to recognize that the only way we will evolve and you know come anywhere closer to our fullest potential is going to be by you know, stumbling and failing, but then having that discipline of learning from each of those failures yes, yes. moving forward. And it's kind of like what you've just done is, you know, as I come from a business school with that like management thinking behind me, you, you've you told me like, actually, that's what near death experiences tend to make people reframe, you know, some of their past, um, you know, acts of uh, omission and commission. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's not it's not just the life review, but other parts of the experience as well. Uh, help help you reassess what you've been doing in your life um and they all people often change their careers uh, relationships break up after a near-death experience because people are so transformed by it and let me give you an example of that one fellow i knew steve price he was a uh, kind of a rough guy he had been a, a high school bully and his life goal was to be in the marines and he got to join the marines and he became a sergeant in in vietnam and he was leading his platoon in battle, and he was shot in the chest, and he had shrapnel throughout his lungs, and he was air evacuated to a hospital in the Philippines, 
for surgery. And during the surgery, he had a near-death experience in which he had a, had a confrontation with deceased loved ones, with a deity, and came back with this feeling again that we're all in this together. We're all part of something greater than ourselves. We have divinity with ourselves, and it's the same as the divine. And when he came back from his near-death experience, after he finished rehabilitation, he was sent back into Vietnam and found that he couldn't fire his rifle. The idea of hurting someone else was just unthinkable to him now. So he ended up having to leave the Marines. Uh, he ended up coming back to the States and, and training to be a medical technician. But I've heard similar stories from people who were uh, police officers who, after a near-death experience, couldn't go back into the field and fire their guns. I've heard from cutthroat businessmen who used to get ahead at other people's expense, come back from a near-death experience saying, I, 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 it just makes no sense to me anymore. And they tend to run their businesses in a much more compassionate way. I've known people who were in organized crime in the same way. And I've known people who were um, addicts who just totally transformed their lives after this near-death experience. So it's a, it's a really transformative event. And as you can imagine, it often creates a lot of havoc in their lives if, if their families and friends don't particularly like these changes. Hmm, yeah. I mean, that, that's incredible. The, the range of uh, characters that you have spoken yes. about in yes. terms of the paths they were on and then what kind of a shake-up and wake-up call they received. Um, there's so much to unpack there. I want to come back to this, um, you know, th this question about how does this, how does this kind of more permanently change or shift uh, the perspective and attitudes of those who've gone through it? Uh, and then, and then, what does it mean for for the rest of us who haven't, yeah. you know, been been going through it? I mean, one of the things I want to maybe qualify for our audience here. Um, I, I know this is, you know, quite quite obvious to you, uh, Dr. Grayson, because because you've shared this in your book. Uh, is that um, look? I mean, many of the conversations we ha have here in intersections are with people who have pursued a certain kind of peak performance, a certain kind of well-lived life, kind of you know, kind of like like path. And 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 part of our quest is to unpack from them what's that secret, you know, to yes. to pursuing that and to gaining that kind of like success. And and this one is a little different in the following sense that uh, our conversation, Dr. Grayson, is, is not as much about saying like, wow, this NDE sounds like such an amazing experience. I wanna have it. How do I get it? <laughs> How do I get it? Because perhaps we are really fortunate in not having to face yeah. Yeah. in any of those moments, you know, that, um, that experience of being at the brink, you know, of something that uh, most of us, you know, are not necessarily, you know, keen or looking forward to. So, 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 so the purpose of this conversation to dissect and unpack near-death experiences and the impact they have is not as much to help us figure out like how to get there, but uh, but I want to maybe just hold the audience in a space of just curiosity right now and intrigue about well, then what's the purpose of this conversation for the rest of us, right? Yes. Hopefully, hopefully a little bit of that is happening. Because when we understand something like the life review and the experience of, I think you've shared, Dr. Grayson, that it's not just from like how you were feeling in that moment, but you know, as you mentioned in the case of Tom Sawyer, um, you also in those life reviews tend to experience it in terms of what you were doing to others and the feelings yes, yes, that you were yes. making other people experience. I mean, that yeah. is powerful. And so there, clearly, there are lessons here for us, for all of us. Yes. So, so we want to come back to that. But I hope in the meanwhile, our audience is freely drawing their own conclusions about, hey, this is this insight from here that I want to take into my life. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. uh, but, but before we, we, we talk about kind of the long term uh, growth and impact it has on the, uh, the experiences, um, what is the... Um, you know, let's look at the NDE first. There is a question here from from one of our uh, you know uh, friends in the audience. Henry is Henry's asking, how long does an NDE typically last in terms of real real time, physical time? Yeah. Well, in terms of our time, uh, you know, earthly time, it often seems to last just a matter of seconds or minutes. Uh, it's usually when the person is unconscious and the other. You know, Heart and the, usually the brain activity has stopped for a while, and it's a very short amount of time. But when you ask them what happened, it takes them hours and hours to tell you about it. So how can they? How can this be? And they say they say quite frequently that there is no time in the near death experience. They say that time didn't exist, or that they they were aware that there was Earth time, but it didn't apply to them that time seemed to dilate and, and it was all the time in the world, things were all happening at once. And 
you know, that, that doesn't quite make sense to me living in earth time. So I, I put that to them. I say, look, when you're describing your near death experience, you're describing it as a sequence of events. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. And yet you say, there's no time. How can you have a sequence of events without time? And they just shrug and say, well, I know it's a paradox here now that we're back on the earth in our brains, but it wasn't a paradox there. Everything made perfect sense there. And you know, this, this change between the way you think in the near-death experience and the way you think here on Earth extends way beyond that. They often say that what happened to me is indescribable. I can't put it into words. There's, there are no words to describe it. One person said it's like trying to draw an odor with a crayon. You, you, can't, you can't do it. And then we say to them, sure, great, that's great. Tell me all about it. You know, so we make them distorted by putting it into words. And by doing that, it sometimes doesn't make sense in words. They say there's just so many words that don't come close to conveying what really happened. So we know we're not getting a literal description of what happened. We're getting a metaphoric description. We're getting the feelings, but not the actual facts, if there are facts um, on the other side. Yeah. You know, my, my daughter um, uh, ha has a strong fondness for poetry. And, um, you know, at one point I was, I was asking her, what does poetry mean to her, both in appreciating works of, you know, uh, literature and poetry and, and doing some of her own. And she says that, you know, poetry uh, to her is a mechanism through which to express the inexpressible. Yes, um, yes. And uh, I found that to be very eye-opening for me because I come from a very logical, logical kind of grounding, having studied math and, and logic as my right. core passions. And, uh, and I started to realize how, how true her statement was. I think you're agreeing with it, uh, Dr. Grayson, that... Um, you know, language is such, in some ways, a finite construct, a limiting construct yeah, for yeah. the ethereal, for the ephemeral, for the things that maybe lie beyond the common mass experiences of humanity, uh, which doesn't mean that those experiences are inaccessible to all of us. Uh, some of us have experienced uh, those things. Yes, yes. Some perhaps might experience them commonly, and, and all of us might experience them in some fleeting moment here or there. But we just never, as society, come together to codify those in certain shared you know, uh, forms right. of language and words right. and semantics and all of that, right? And yeah. so um, what you just said just struck a chord with me uh, when you said yeah. that yeah. these people sometimes struggle to put into words yeah. what yeah. has been a very profound experience for them. And, and many of them give up trying to use words and they will try to um, put it into, into art, paint it or try to draw it or c try to write music that would convey the, the sense, but they just don't feel words can do it. Wow, that is uh, that is so incredibly powerful. Um, there is one of those metaphors that you have shared in your book, which I would love for you to share with our community today. Um, and it was about when you're walking on a dark, uh, rainy, yes. uh, you know, kind of uh, just yeah, road, right? Could could yeah. you could you share that metaphor? Sure. It, that one particular one was um, someone described walking down uh, a dark in a dark road. Uh, dark uh, in a dark night, um, and it's you know raining, and you can't see very much. And all of a sudden, there's a flash of lightning, and the whole world gets illuminated. And you see what's on the side of the roads. You can see the trees. You can see everything around you. And then when the lightning flashes over, you're left in the dark again, and you can't see it anymore. But you remember what was there. You remember what you saw. And many people have used an analogy like this. Anita Morjani who had a, a near-death experience when she was her body was ravished with, with tumors and they didn't think she was gonna survive. She has a beautiful analogy of, of us living in a huge warehouse with the lights out and you have a little flashlight that you can hold and, and point it at different things, but you don't have any idea of what's really in the, what, the warehouse. And suddenly someone turns the light on and you see that it goes on for row after row after row, hundreds of feet long and, and all these wonderful things you never dreamt were there and then the light goes out again, and you're left back with your flashlight. And you can shine it around, but you can't see everything. But you remember what's there, and you come back with that knowledge. Wow, that is, uh, that is so beautiful. Um, I want to kind of probe that um, in, in just a couple of minutes around what is that knowledge? What is the um, substantive kind of ahas that they gain beyond the life review? Uh, before we do that, there are a couple of comments and thoughts here from our friends sure. in the audience. I'm going to just kind of read them here for a minute and, and, and put them up here for us as well. Um, you know, uh, Pranita is asking, um, why do NDEs happen to some people and not to others? Mm. Boy, that's a great question. Uh, 
you know, when we do studies to try to quantify how often they happen, we find generally that people who have a documented cardiac arrest where their hearts stop, between 10 and 20% of people like that will report a near-death experience, which means 80 to 90% don't. Um, so why is that? We've looked at all the different physiological things that are going on during the heart attack. Uh, we looked at personality traits, and we can't really find anything that will tell us who's going to have a near-death experience or what kind they're going to have when they come close to death. So we don't really know why some people have them and some people don't. Now, I've asked near-death experiencers the same question. Why do you think some people have them and some people don't? And actually, many of them will have more than one close brush with death, and they all have an ex a near-death experience at, at one of those, but not with the others. And they struggle with that. And what they say is often something to the effect of, you get what you need at the time, or you get what you can handle at the time. Um, so it's, it's kind of a... It's, they put it in terms of someone out there knows what you need or what you can handle, and they give it to you when you need it. Uh, not when you're not ready for it and not when you already know it, but just when you need it, you get it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that, I have no way of testing it. That's not a scientific hypothesis. That's just what they tell me. Yeah, that's uh, that's powerful. Um, I'm you know scrolling through some of the chat here, and there's another beautiful uh, thought here, which might might help us, you know, uh, make make peace with who who gets it and who doesn't. Because Mia mm -hmm. saying it so beautifully that blessed are those who accept and learn from this without needing to experience it themselves. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 So, well, of of course, you know, most of our religions teach the same thing, that. It's all about love and it's all about compassion and it's all about altruism. Um, but you know, there have actually been studies now of people who learn about near-death experiences and looking at whether they absorb some of these same lessons. And there have been uh, several studies now, four studies of college students who are going, giving a course in near-death experience. Ken Ring did this at the University of Connecticut, uh, Chuck Flynn at Miami University. Um, and they test students for their attitudes at the beginning of the course and then after the course, and then often a year later. And they find that just taking a class in near-death experiences makes these students more compassionate and more altruistic in their behavior. They end up volunteering more, doing more. And this has been repeated with nursing students. And there was actually one study done in Ohio with high school students who were given a class in near-death experiences. And they too became much more altruistic in their behavior as a result of learning about near-death experiences. So it does seem to be able to be something you can learn from without actually having to go through the experience itself. Wow, that is that is so powerful. I mean, that, of course, in part is the purpose of uh, our conversation today, to help spark some of that yes. growth in yes. us from all of that you know, rich work and beautiful work that you have done, Dr. Grayson. But the idea that you can actually impart that in a very structured way as part of a curriculum for yes. people in high school and in college at that very formative you know, early stage of yes. their lives and careers, I mean, is, is, uh, is beautiful. It's, it's remarkable. It's very yeah. nice. Yeah. You mentioned Dr. Ken Ring, and I, I wanted to just do a shout out and thank, thank yeah. uh, Ken. I, I hope... Um, there's a chance for him to watch our conversation because he, he's brought us together and yes. he, and he um, has been a very formative figure in, in my investigation yes. of, of these experiences from several decades ago when I first started to kind of like just stumble into some of this work and start to read it. And you, of course, taken it to a, to a beautiful place with uh, with your work and with this book. But um, but it's so great to have you be part of a whole community of researchers, including Dr. Ring, right? Who, who yes, yes. Investing in this. Ken Ring and I were two of the four co-founders of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and he started the Journal of, of Near-Death Studies and did some pioneering work um, in the early 1980s uh, on outlining what these experiences are and how they affect people. Yeah, yeah, oh, amazing. Um, the question here from 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 Gilbert, right? I mean, do the uh, majority of these experiences tend to focus on like? Here's what I didn't do right, and you know where I failed, or or you know, or, or is it more than just that? No, uh, great question, Gilbert. Now they do more than that. Um, they do highlight mostly your interactions with people, um, but the good and the bad, so to speak. You know, the think times you were very helpful to people, and the times when you were not very helpful to people. But it's usually your relationships rather than um, achievements and awards you've gotten. You know, it, but it's how you treated other people. I see. I see. Um, so this to me is the, um, 
you know, the, the, the flagship moment, the capstone moment in our conversation. We are about 20 odd minutes away from, from wrapping up. And Dr. Grayson, I am so struck with the, the clarity, the thoughtfulness, the sensitivity with which you, in your book, profile the wide range of ways in which this experience has a lasting impact on the experiencer. So could you talk a little bit about that? Could you talk about in what ways you know, is their life impacted? You've shared a little bit on, yes. you know, on, on the yes. physical side of like the fact that people in you know, relationships with them sometimes are you know, taken aback by the, yes. you know, by the large you know, shift that is happening in them you know, quite instantly. But could you talk about sort of like, is it mostly positive or, or, or more negative in terms of um, yeah, the shift and changes they go through after this? Well, most people who have this experience talk about the positive benefits of the after effects how it set them on the, quote, right track in life. It's like they were sent back to get, to get a second chance to do it right this time. Um, and they talk about reshaping their lives so they can do that. Uh, and sometimes that means changing your profession. Sometimes it means just doing your profession differently and being more compassionate in how you treat your uh, coworkers and your clients and so forth. Um, but people also talk about the challenges that this poses for them. And often a spouse will not appreciate the changes. Um, you know, and it's often a mixed picture. You know, I mentioned Tom Sawyer before, who was kind of a, a rough guy and, and his wife, I got to know him very well and his wife and his kids. Um, and his wife said, well, you know, he, he doesn't care about material things anymore. We desperately need a new car. He couldn't care less. You know, uh, on the other hand, he's never beaten it. He'd beaten me since he had his near death experience and he's been just so much more compassionate. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed blessing for her. But I do know that a lot of marriages do break up after a near-death experience. It's it's as if one partner has had a religious conversion and the other one hasn't. You know, it's 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 hard to deal with that. Um, often getting into couples therapy has been very helpful. Uh, there are support groups for near-death experiencers, about 50 of them in this country, and, and they're all over the world. Many of them are sponsored by the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And often families will come to those those support groups and talk with other families who've gone through the same thing and, and figure out how they dealt with these changes. But there are, they're very challenging for the experience of themselves to figure out how am I going to live this new life and be true to myself and still be in the physical world. Um, and it's hard sometimes for them to figure it out. It causes a lot of distress for them internally. Um, some, you know, are, are very unhappy about being back here. If those who didn't choose to come back, um, they may feel depressed about it or, or angry about it being brought back and it may take them a while to f learn how to integrate the things they've learned in their experience into this life. Learning to integrate the things they've experienced into this life. That uh, sounds like a really important um, responsibility, you know, for yes, them to yes. pursue, isn't it? Um, I'm, I'm uh, picking up your book and, um, you know, just kind of like reading a couple of sections here, which um, I thought were incredibly powerful. You, you talk about the wide ranging and long lasting effects of the, uh, you know, of the NDEs. Um, and you, you talk about how as a psychiatrist, you know how hard it is to get people to make even modest yes. changes <laughs> in their lives, often requiring yeah. weeks, months or years of intensive work. And I know that too, because I, I, I'm a teacher and around this theme of personal leadership, right? Like how to kind of approach your full potential. Right. And yet you're saying experiences you know, feel like the NDEs like overhauled their lives in a matter of yeah. seconds. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And you know, now that I've been doing this work for so many years, um, I can do long-term studies and I can go back and interview people again that I interviewed in the late 1970s and early 1980s and see whether their accounts of the experiences changed over time and the after effects. And what we have found is that neither one has changed. What they tell us now about the experience is the same as what they told us 30, 40 years ago. Absolutely no differences. And similarly, the after effects are basically the same. They feel as, as uh, driven to, to pursue these new goals now as they did when they just first had the experience. It doesn't fade over time. Yeah, yeah. And I just for you know our audience's benefit, want to recount a few things that you've said about some of these changes, and then perhaps you can react to that, uh, Dr. Grayson. Um, you're, you're saying that people see a different reality. Um, you know, they um, they they 
continue to regard the world of the NDE as more real than yes, our everyday yes. physical world. Yeah, uh, yeah. that is uh, that is eye opening. I, I actually, you know, it reminds me of a moment. I, I was uh, at a film theater uh, with uh, with a friend of mine, and for some reason, you know, uh, we were having a conversation before the film started, and um, you know, she, she was asking me a little bit about my meditation practice. Uh, and I was, I was just, you know, offering her some, some, some guidance and inspiration about, you know, how um, intangible but, but powerful the journey is. And, uh, and at some point she said, yeah, but it sounds, it sounds so hard to really concretize. I mean, how, how, how do you know it's, how do you know it's real? <laughs> she said, how do you know it's real? Those yeah. feelings and experiences, whatever it is that you're experiencing, right? And I instinctively, not, not from any kind of like forethought, I, I just happened to share with her. I said, listen, so-and-so, I want you to know that... I feel that experience for me is more real yeah, yeah. and I believe more in it than I believe and I feel real about the fact that you and I are sitting here going to watch this movie yes. and, and her eyes popped out and she said, what do you mean? I said, well, look, you and I will watch this movie <laughs> and it'll, it'll wrap up and then we'll go back into our lives and then a few years later, it'll be like a faded memory mm -hmm. and I may not even recall what movie it was and I you know, may not even recall which year we watched it. And maybe at some point I'll even forget that we watched this movie and you might remind me. So that way, how real is it, <laughs> you know, when, yeah, when the memory yeah. over time. But I said, but what I experienced there, it's consistent and it keeps growing and building yeah. on itself. And it's never, it, it, you know, it's never different from what it was, you know. So, so to that end, I find that there's a sense of stability and just... Um, yeah, just uh, timelessness to whatever it is that, you know, one experiences. In the so I have two questions for you. One is, um, yeah, I mean, is, is that is that sort of like what you meant when you, when you talk about these folks uh, looking at that world as more real for them? And also, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I guess, drawing a connection here between, you know, the pursuits that, you know, some people have taken on in, in, in more mystical traditions to study consciousness from a deeper lens, uh, perhaps through paths of meditation. And, uh, you know, what connection, if any, do you find between that and the experiences and the years go through? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff Long, who's a radiation oncologist who runs the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, um, has found that in his sample, which is several thousand near-death experiences, that 97% insists that the near-death experience is more real than this physical world. And I have heard that from one experience after another. One fellow that I work with, um, he was a college student who was uh, schizophrenic. He was hearing voices. He heard the voice of Satan telling him uh, that he was Satan's spawn and he needed to kill himself. So he climbed up to the roof of his dorm and jumped off the roof. And he said to me that halfway down, as he was falling, God spoke to him and reassured him that he was not the devil's spawn. He was the child of God, and God was not going to let him die like this. And he actually ended up breaking several bones but not, not dying. And when I talked to him in the hospital uh, after that, um, I said, now, wait a minute, you're telling me that you heard two voices that no one heard except you. And you're saying that the voice of Satan was a hallucination from your schizophrenia and the voice of God was real. How can you tell them apart? And what he said to me was, I can't explain it to you, but except to say that God's voice was more real than yours is right now, the way yours is real, more real than the devil's is. And I've heard that from experiencer after experiencer, that they say that what happened in the NDE had a, a noetic realness to it that this world just doesn't have. Wow. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing. Thank you yeah. for sharing. I, I, I want to keep. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Did you want to? Well, you also asked about the connection with with uh, yes, with meditation, with, with uh, meditation and other. You know, of course, the near death experience is not the only way of reaching this um, mystical state, if you want to call it that, um, this otherworldly realm. And that there have been mystical traditions throughout the ages from different religions, different spiritual traditions to get to this other state. Um, so I think the near-death experience is just one of the most reliable ways we have now of, of getting there. But of course, it's the most traumatic way as well. You know, uh, but you can certainly get the same experience, the same message from other means as well. One difference, though, is that when you engage in a spiritual tradition to get there, you usually have training to do it, and you have um, you have the intent to get there. You're trying to do it, and you have guides either in person or in writing to help you understand and inter integrate that into your life. Whereas the near death experience comes to you unexpected and unbidden. You don't look for it; it just comes upon you. You're totally unprepared for it, and you don't have a guide 
to help you understand it when you come back. Um, so I think for that reason, some of the after effects may be different because it was so unexpected and something you didn't prepare for. Uh, it may have more profound impact for that reason because you weren't trying to get it. Sometimes when you like try to take psychedelic drugs to have an experience, when you come back, you may say, well, it wasn't really real. I was taking the drugs. And with the near-death experience, you don't have that excuse to say, no, it wasn't real because I did this or that. It was just there. It was an experience you had that you weren't trying to have. Um, um, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I, I, I love that connection. I love that connection. Um, I want to read a couple of other quotes from your book. And, and part of it is because I, I want to really encourage our audience to... Um, to go out and get it, I, I think that you know there, there's there's so much richness to this conversation, Dr. Grayson. You're 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 very gracious to have made the time for us today, and at the same time, there is so much additional richness, you know, to yeah. the stories and thoughts that you have in your book. That for me, it's going to be a, a, a reference source, you know, for for a long time to come, for a long time to come. So just a couple of things, which I and, and you, by the way, you you write beautifully. You, you write oh, thank beautifully. You. I, thank you. Know, so so thank you for integrating so much sensitivity and spirituality and. Just, um, just a kind of like a higher kind of level of consciousness, even in the way you talk about higher consciousness. You know, I, I love it. So, so here you're saying you're saying people who've experienced an NGE, they seem to have increased compassion and concern for others, and a sense of connection to and desire to serve other people, which often leads to more altruistic behavior. Experiences tend to see themselves as integral parts of a benevolent and purposeful universe in which personal gain particularly at someone else's expense, is no longer relevant. They also report feeling greater understanding, acceptance, and tolerance of others. Aren't those the kinds of qualities that we are really hurting for right now in humanity oh, yes. <laughs> to, uh, to experience and practice more? Yeah, yeah, indeed they are. And uh, you know, it, it's kind of our hope that, that as word gets out about these near-death experiences that may eventually affect uh, our culture and our society, um, and people in power who are, are directing our society. You know, there have been major uh, world figures who have had near-death experiences, often as a result of a heart attack, and led them to change their, their uh, behavior and change their, their policies. And one good example, example of that was Anwar Sadat, um, the president of Egypt, who, after his near-death experience, engaged in the, the, the peace talks that Jimmy Carter uh, orchestrated between Israel and Egypt. Um, another was Mikhail Gorbachev uh, of the Soviet Union, who, after his near-death experience, um, worked with uh, with Ronald Reagan and then did tear down the Berlin Wall and, and stop being as belligerent as he had been before. So there are examples of this, but often it comes not from the top, but from below, uh, from the common people, enough of them having enough of a change, becoming more enlightened, and that brings about a change in society. That is incredible. I did not know those stories about Anwar yeah. Sadat or Mikhail Gorbachev. Of course, one knows about what they did in that moment, yeah. but yeah. one hadn't really um, linked it to certain, you know, trigger events like that. Um, well, of course, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. they didn't say it was linked to that. I'm just drawing it because it did happen right after their near-death experience. Yeah, yeah. Wow. How incredible. How incredible. Um, Anuradha has a beautiful thought. She says... Um, when the opportunity of being born as a human is taken away, one realizes, you know, what a gift one had and perhaps, uh, you know, may not have used it, you know, for the right realization. And so, uh, you know, she's on a, you know, a trail of thoughts here. And, and, and there are some universal, perhaps right ways of living as human beings. And most might shut out that inner voice that may, 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 may be guiding us, but instead be guided by influences of society and desires and ambitions. And when one is losing that gift of the human body, maybe things become a lot clearer. Yeah, yeah. So that, that raises another point in my mind that um, some people have said that this is just the effect of coming of almost losing your life. And that makes you reevaluate what happens. And, and that's true. But people who almost lose their life and don't have a near death experience don't have all the same range of after effects as near death experiences do. They tend to value life more dearly after they've almost lost it. But that often makes them more cautious more frightened of losing their lives and more conservative in that in their behavior. Whereas near-death experiencers lose their fear of death and dying, and they come back having an increased uh, joy of life because they're not afraid of losing it. So they end up engaging more fully in life, living more in the present, and taking more chances because they're not afraid of losing it. They end up leading a, leading a life that's more meaningful and fulfilling than otherwise. 
Okay. Uh, just out of my mathematical bend, I want to just pause here for a second just to help our audience and, and me connect between uh, these two different kind of contrasting states that you've talked about. So one is where somebody's had a near-death experience, and the other is where somebody has nearly lost their life. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And I know at the very beginning of our conversation, you defined what a near-death experience is, yeah. but it might be helpful for our audience to recognize the difference between those two so we don't conflate them. So if you could just, um, you know, for a moment, just tell us when somebody is just, uh, you know, uh, uh, going through an experience where they've almost lost their life, you know, why may that not be a near-death experience? Yeah. Well, many people do come close to death or are maybe pronounced dead, but don't have any conscious experience that they can remember. So we can't call that a near-death experience. It's not a near-death event, but they didn't experience anything. Whereas people of a near-death experience, when they have this close brush with death, they actually have this experience of being in another realm or leaving their bodies or having the life review and engaging in active thought, which alone is, is amazing that they can have this complex experience when their brains are not really functioning very well. We have no explanation for how that could be. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Um, there's another piece I want to read from your writings about the impact this has on, on people. And um, you say that... Um, those who have near-death experiences show a greater zest for life, mm. have a more intense appreciation for nature and friendship, yes. and yes. live more fully in the moment without concern for the impression that they might make. Yes, yes. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they feel that in this other realm, they still existed and felt wonderful without the usual labels that we put on ourselves here, you know, um, I'm male, I'm a certain age, I'm an American, you know, I've got a certain political affiliation, a religious affiliation maybe, and those things were not part of who they were in the afterlife, and yet they felt better without them. So they come back no longer really valuing all those distinctions that make us different from other people, and what they value are the things that make us the same as every other one, every other person, the same universal feelings everyone has, the same sense of connection to everyone else. And they feel that they come back realizing that they are part of something greater than themselves. You know, this was driven home to me I, as a as a psychiatrist. When I heard near-death experiences say that they're no longer afraid of death, I started worrying if that was going to make people more suicidal. Because I know people who are tired of this life are often deterred from taking their lives because they're afraid of something that's going to happen if they die. So I did a study of people who made suicide attempts, and I compared those who had a near-death experience as a result of the attempt with those who didn't. And what we found was that um, people who had a near-death experience after their suicide attempt were far less suicidal after it than people who didn't have a near-death experience. And again, Ken Ring repeated that study with another population and found the same thing. And when I asked the experiencers why this was, they said, again, when you lose your fear of, of dying, you lose your fear of living and you come back with a sense of the purpose of everything that goes on here. And even my suffering becomes something I'm supposed to learn from, not something to run away from. And you can gain from every experience you have. So they tend to dig into life and explore everything they're doing in great detail and getting the most out of it. And they live their lives much more intently, intensively, much more mindfully, and they get more fully involved and feel find it much more fulfilling. And that makes them their life seem so much more worth living than it was before. Yeah. When you lose your fear of dying, you lose your fear of living. Yes. What a yeah. powerful idea. What yes. a powerful idea. Um, Dr. Grayson, um, you know, there's one last piece that I, I want to invite you to kind of weigh in on. Um, and again, I'm quoting from, from your book. Um, you say many experiences, like this one that you're profiling in this chapter, Christine, they report that the most meaningful change after an NDE is an increase in the sense of spirituality. Yes. And you also talk there about what spirituality means, which I thought yeah. was quite beautiful. You said it is the aspect of the personal lives that includes something beyond the usual senses yeah. and a personal search for inspiration, meaning, and purpose, a quest to connect with something greater than themselves. Yeah. Yeah. This is something that... I grew up without any type of religious or spiritual background and, and I didn't have any of that. And as far as I could tell, I wasn't missing anything and I didn't see the need for that. But I've seen from the near-death experiences how important that aspect of life is to enriching your life and making it as full as it can possibly be. 
And I think other people have this experience or have this sense of spirituality without realizing it. It's just a sense of there being something greater than the physical world and the fact that you are something more than just this physical body. There's more to you than just that. And that what there is that's beyond this physical body is the same that everyone else has and the same that divinity is made of. And if you realize that and live that, then you see the divinity in everyone else as well. And that makes you become more compassionate towards other people who may seem on the surface to be very different from you, but you know now that they are the same as you. Mm. That is so special. That is so beautiful. Um, you know, I, it struck me as we come to the end of this hour, and there's one last question I want to pose to you before we before we wrap up. Would you be open to that? Just a, a few sure. more minutes. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, is that often in these conversations, I am you know, inviting the audience to like pose questions and to share comments and all of this. And this time I've been like so spellbound by the conversation we've been having that I've forgotten to do that. And on the <laughs> other hand, the irony and the paradox is that when I look at the chat window, it is replete, you know, with so much um, conversation and questions that are happening anyway. So it's, mm -hmm. so you got us both in your grip, you know, the audience and me. Uh, I think there's, there's just so much engagement yeah. and uh, stirring that you've caused. Yeah, so thank you. Um, and uh, and I guess, you know, I, a two part kind of like last little, you know, kind of piece, you know, to, to inquire from you what. One is, I really like, you know, in, in your book, the um, conversation that you, you know, invite us to have about the relationship between science and spirituality. Yes. To actually, yeah. um, you know, take these two disciplines that in, in the past may, you know, have been at odds, you know, with each other, but to actually see them as ultimately pursuing the same end and, um, you know, uh, disciplines that can be very complementary to each other. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I grew up in a, in a scientific tradition, and that's still what I feel is, is me. Um, and I can't not think in those terms. But I've come to appreciate the spiritual approach also as I've gone through the decades of this research. And I, I feel that both science and spirituality are both trying to get at the truth using a different set of tools. And I've come to appreciate that using one alone does not give you a full picture of the universe. Um, you need to actually see both sides. And what I find is that great scientists um, like Albert Einstein and great spiritual leaders like the Dalai Lama also say the same thing, that science and spirituality are complementary. They're not conflicting at all. They're, they're both different ways of helping us understand ourselves and our role in the universe. And you need to appreciate both approaches to understand what's really going on. Dr. Grayson, I, I see you as an exemplary um, story uh, of uh, what a scientist uh, truly, you know, should be. Um, this this capacity in you to zoom out, to inquire, to ask the hardest questions, to pursue what otherwise might be considered to be immeasurable, mm -hmm. and to do it, you know, with a long term intent of just helping advance the discipline in slow but very tangible steps. Um, and to be able to, through that, bring about some amount of, I'm guessing and I'm sensing from our conversation, some personal transformation as well. Yes, yes. Um, could you talk about that as, as the last part of a conversation, which is, um, you know, how, how has this pursuit, you know, changed you? Well, of course, as I said, you know, I started out without any sense of what the spiritual world was like anyway. Um, and I... I had serious doubts when I first started doing this work that that it was real, that it wasn't just imaginary. And we did several studies to differentiate this mystical experience from mental illness. And we found that there was actually no overlap at all when you would look at what's really going on with these two. And I've published several papers that are referenced in my book, um, documenting the differences between fantasies and dreams and hallucinations and these near-death experiences. So I've come to appreciate over the decades that um, we need to understand spirituality and be open to this. Uh, when I started off, I was a hardcore materialist scientist. I thought we're going to have all the answers before too long. And now I'm very comfortable with the idea that we're not going to have the answers. And that's fine. You know, it, we don't have to understand it because our brains are too simple to understand it. And maybe when we leave, leave our brains, we will understand it fully. You know, I don't know what's going to happen when we die because people who have been there and back tell me that there are no words for it. So how can I possibly understand it? Um, and I, I, I believe that. Um, I'm, still, I'm still a skeptic at heart. And I, there's part of me that says, you're misinterpreting this whole thing. There's really a very simple explanation for it. I can't imagine what it is. Um, 
But I have those doubts, of course. But I think the preponderance of the evidence suggests to me that death is not the end, and that even though I don't know what happens afterwards, I'm fairly confident that something is waiting for us out there, and it's not something to be feared. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. This has been incredibly illuminating and inspiring, as you might be seeing from some of the mm -hmm. uh, guests' reactions as well. Uh, Dr. Grayson, I... Um, you know, it reminds me this last piece of what you've shared, um, you know, um, about a quote from from Einstein, one of the figures you mentioned who yeah. was was clearly a very renowned scientist and a pathbreaker, but also deeply spiritual, you know, and, and, and yes, he said yes. once, I'm sure, I'm sure you know this uh, thought from him, he said, there are two ways in, you know, by which you can live. One is as though nothing is a miracle, <laughs> and the other is as though like everything yes. is a miracle. Yes. You know? Yeah, so beautiful. Well, um, I want to wish you Godspeed and that you continue to advance the, you know, very, very important, you know, uh, discipline of near-death studies. Um, what is your what is your next big dream in life as you uh, continue to add and contribute to this to this work? Uh, and maybe we'll end with that last word from you. Where are you seeking to take this discipline? Well, I, I think um, I feel very good that the, this the next step will not be mine. Um, that in fact there is a new generation of near-death researchers all over the world, a large group in Belgium, a large group in New Zealand, you know, they're all over the world who are pursuing this with different areas of expertise than I have and different outlooks than I have. So that I can't imagine what the next steps are gonna be because they're beyond my level of expertise. But I feel confident that the work is, is going to go on for a long period of time. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. So folks, uh, on that note, let us, um, you know, thank Dr. Grayson and, and uh, bid him adieu and wish him well on, on that journey in helping nurture and develop the next generation of near-death experience researchers. And uh, the book, After uh, a Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond, is now available at Amazon or your, you know, uh, neighborhood bookstore. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Grayson, for, for joining us for this. And we, you know, wish you all the best in both life and in your work. Thank you, Atendra. I've, I've enjoyed this very much. Yeah. Thank you, folks, and we will be seeing you soon for another episode of Intersections. Uh, thank you for bringing an openness and a curiosity and so much heart and, you know, your own stories as well to our conversation today. Keep it going. Uh, have a great next couple of weeks, and we'll be in touch.